Well, good morning, good morning, good morning. If you'll find your seat, we are going to get started today. If you're joining us online via Facebook, we're so glad that you have chosen to be with us today. Uh, hope that you had an amazing Thanksgiving. Uh, hope that you had some time to reflect upon all the bounty of God's blessing in and through your lives. Uh, also, want to thank God for all of this. Aren't we grateful for those who stayed last week and helped deck these halls to get ready uh, for this Advent season? Also, excited to have our brother Chuck Bokaiza, his dear wife Ellen, and uh, their children Charlie, JJ, and Trinity with us today to worship alongside us. Uh, John Oliveris and his family are away for Thanksgiving. It's always great to have you with us, my brother, leading us in worship. So friends, this Advent season is what we're in now. These four Sundays leading up to Christmas Day is what the church historically has said. We want to use these Sundays to prepare our hearts, to prepare a sense of expectation for the coming and the celebration of the first Advent of the Lord Jesus Christ, and the celebration that Jesus is coming again. And so each week of these next four Sundays, we will light Advent candles, and those candles are not just something we do, they actually have meaning, and they're building expectation and longing for the celebration of Christ. As George Eldon Ladd, the great theologian, said that Christmas is a celebration of a divine invasion. And that is what Christmas is, friends. It is God invading human history. And let me invite you to stand with me and hear God's word as we prepare to sing today and respond in song. See, the people of God, Israel, as they had awaited their Messiah, they clung to these words. Micah 5, verse 2. The word of God says, O Bethlehem, Ephrathah, who are too little to be among the clans of Judah. From you shall come forth for me one who is to be the ruler in Israel, whose coming forth is from of old, from ancient days. Therefore he shall give them up until the time when she who is in labor has given birth, and then the rest of his brothers shall return to the people of Israel." And he, verse 4, shall stand and shepherd his flock in the strength of the Lord, in the majesty of the name of the Lord his God, and they shall dwell secure for now. Would you say now? He shall be great to the ends of the earth, and he shall be their peace. What a season, friends, we enter into, and what a God. What a God that would provide for us our greatest need, namely the forgiveness of sin so that we could be at peace with our creator, God. Let's pray together. Lord, thank you so much for this time today that we have to corporately glorify and magnify your beautiful name. And Lord, we pray that would be what takes place today as we celebrate Jesus, that you have come, and we celebrate Jesus, that you will come again. And so we pray, Holy Spirit, that you would make Jesus big in this time today. Thank you for Chuck and their family coming today to lead us in song. May you inhabit the praise of your people now. We pray all of this for Jesus' sake and by the Spirit. Let's respond in song. Shall come. 
come to Thee, O Israel. O come, Thou day spring, come and cheer our spirits by Thine advent here. Disperse the gloomy clouds of night, and this dark shadows put to fly. Yes, rejoice, rejoice, Emmanuel shall come to thee, O Israel. from on high and order all things far and nigh to us the path of knowledge show and cause us in her ways to go rejoice rejoice Emmanuel shall come to thee, O Israel. O come, desire of nations, bind all peoples in one heart and mind did it in the strife and cordial seas fill the whole world with heaven's peace rejoice 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 Emmanuel shall come to thee, O Israel. Sing rejoice again. Rejoice, rejoice, Emmanuel shall come to thee, O You guys can have a seat. Lighting a candle a simple yet profound act. It is a testimony to the power of light over darkness. The light of just one candle can push away the darkness. As we light this first candle of Advent, we begin our journey to Christmas. The first candle of Advent is called the hope or prophecy candle. As we anticipate Christmas, let us remember those who first spoke the promise of the coming Christ child. Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and, he, and will call him Emmanuel. Isaiah 7, 14. For to us, a child is born. To us, a son is given. And the government shall be upon his shoulder. And his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and of peace, there will be no end. On the throne of David and over his kingdom, 
to establish it and to uphold it with justice, with righteousness, from this time forth and forevermore. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. Isaiah 9, 6 to 7. Like the prophets of old, God's people are called to have hope in God through the birth, death, and resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. I wait for the Lord, my whole being await, and in his word I put my hope. Those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. They will and not be faint. And again, Isaiah says, The roots of Jesse will spring up, one who will arise to rule over the nations. In him the Gentiles will hope. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Psalms 130, verse 5, Isaiah 40, verse 31, Romans 15, 12 through 13, 1 Peter 1, verse 3. Praise, Praise be to the God, God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. 1 Peter 1, 3. Brothers and sisters, as they work on that, I want to lead us now in a time of confession together. We're a body that acknowledges. <laughs> Jordan had trick candles up there. Uh, we're a body that acknowledges our sin, um, and we're commanded to do so before God. Uh, we have not loved him with our whole heart. We have not treasured him this week as we should. And so I want to ask you uh, with me to silently confess our sins to God.
us, merciful God, we humbly repent and we come to you who is called gracious and merciful. Lord, forgive us, we pray. Amen. Please stand as we read this passage in response to our confession of sin, where John is reminding the church of who we have in Jesus Christ. This is 1 John chapter 2, verses 1 and 2. Let's read this out loud together. My little children, I am writing these things to you so that you may not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. He is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. Praise God. Let's respond to the advocate who we have in Jesus Christ by singing this song together. Marvelous grace of our loving Lord, grace that exceeds our sin and our guilt. Yonder on Calvary's mount outpoured, there where the blood of the Lamb was spilled. Grace, grace. God's grace, grace that will pardon and cleanse within. Grace, grace, God's grace, grace that is greater than all our sin. Sin and despair like the sea waves cold Threaten the soul with infinite loss Grace that is greater, yes, grace untold Points to the refuge, the mighty cross Grace, grace God's grace, grace that will pardon and cleanse within. Grace, grace, God's grace, grace that is greater than all our sin. Dark is the stain that we cannot hide. What can avail to wash it away? Look, there is flowing a crimson tide. Whiter than snow you may be today. Grace, grace. God's grace, grace that will pardon and cleanse within. Grace, grace, God's grace, grace that is greater than all our sin. Marvelous, infinite, matchless grace Freely bestowed on all who believe You that are longing to see His face Will you this moment His grace receive? Grace, grace, God grace, grace that will pardon and cleanse within, grace, grace, God's grace, grace that is greater than all our sin. 
And then you guys can have a seat. Hi, my name is Phil, and along with my wife Becca and our two boys, we are your missionaries serving in Vienna, Austria. Because of your generous giving, we are able to share the light of Christ to the nearly two million people who don't know the good news. So thank you for giving to the cooperative program and to the Lottie Moon Christmas offering so that our family can live here, gather locals to study God's word and plant new churches. Okay, yeah, we're fanging on. Well, today we begin our annual Lottie Moon Christmas offering. Now, if you don't have a Southern Baptist background, you might be thinking, who, what, who in the world is Lottie Moon? Well, I'm glad you asked. Phil, in this video, along with his wife, Becca, are full-time, fully funded missionaries to Australia. To Austria. Let me say it again, full-time, fully funded missionaries to Austria. They don't raise their own support. They don't come back home and write letters. They don't try to beg churches to give them money. They are fully funded, taking care of medical insurance, uh, at home, uh, all the necessities of life, of doing life in Austria. Uh, they are fully funded by dollars that are put together through the arm of the Southern Baptist Convention called the International Mission Board. He mentioned in there the cooperative program. And that's what it is. We as SBC churches cooperate together, put our dollars and our resources together so that we can put more than 3,500 people, just like Phil and his wife, on the mission field to be able to do and spread the fame and name of Jesus there in Austria. Now, to put that in perspective, last year uh, at this time, Southern Baptist churches put together $203 million. $203 million were put together by cooperating churches, and that money goes to support people like Becca and people like Phil. And so you pray about how God wants to use you in the next uh, several Sundays leading up to 2023 because our goal here at the church is $5,000. And so we believe over the next several months, we can put $5,000 together. That $5,000 goes into a pool with other churches, just like PVC, so that we can get the gospel to the ends of the earth. And uh, this year's goal, uh, church-wide, $196 million. And so every week, pray. Pray about how God wants to use you to give. This is a major part of what makes us a Southern Baptist church. Yes, theologically, yes, practically, yes, doctrinally, but we are part of something way bigger than a church in Parma, Ohio. We are connected to all these other body of believers who are supporting uh, missionaries just like that. So you pray about that. And the reason it's Lottie Moon is Lottie Moon was a missionary to China, a very short little woman that was used powerfully by God. She died December 24th, 1912. That's why it's Lottie Moon, because this is the time that she passed away, you know, over 100 years ago. And so this offering is given in her honor, because Lottie had such a heart as she went to China to spread the fame and name of Jesus. And she wrote letters back. You can find some of those letters pleading with God's people, send dollars, send resources so that we can spread the gospel globally. So you pray about that. If you are a guest with us today, welcome. So glad that you are with us. If you're in the house or you're watching via Facebook, um, we are glad you're here. In the back of the pew back, or the front, or the, the, the pew back in front of you rather, is this card, a connect card. That connect card is really important to us because by you putting information there about yourself, it lets us know how we can better minister to you. 
If you're online, send us a direct message. We'll reach back out to you so that we can connect with you. Also, if you're in need of prayer on that Connect card, please write your prayer request down. Write your praise down and put them in the boxes on your way out on the back and then also up top, and we would love to be able to join with you in prayer. If you brought a financial gift, that's also the way that we give here. Uh, There's giving boxes there at the back for you to place your financial contribution in for which we praise God for. Also, if you want to give online, uh, join us at pvc.org, click on the giving tab, follow the prompts, and we say thank you on the front end. Now, speaking of those prayer requests that you're going to put on that card, uh, we're going to take those, and on Wednesday night, we join together for midweek prayer. It's a really important part of our rhythm as a church for us to gather together and cry out to God in prayer. How many of you know prayer is power? It's power. And so us coming together praying is vitally important to the life of this body. And so I want to challenge you to be a part of that, PVC members. I mean, at least a couple of times a month for you to come and join with us on Wednesday night and pray. That's at 6.30 every Wednesday night. So join us. Let me highlight as well a couple of announcements. This Saturday, 8 a.m., down the road at Bob Evans, our men are going together for breakfast there. Uh, You'll be responsible, brothers, for paying for your own breakfast. Um, And uh, we will join there for about an hour, like normal, uh, open God's Word, pray together. And if you have any questions, see our brother Jason Smith as our men's leader. But that's this Saturday, 8 a.m., Bob Evans, just down the road. That same day at 1030 here at the church building, our ladies are having their annual Christmas craft, $10 a lady, $10 a sister. And if you want to uh, sign up for that, there's a sign-up sheet in the lower lobby when you come in the doors. You'll also pay there and uh, get ready for that coming on Saturday. There'll be a speaker. Uh, The gospel will be proclaimed. And so pray for our ladies. A really, really great time. And then also a week from today, following morning corporate worship, uh, we will have churchwide fellowship, member meeting, and a budget vote. Our 2023 budget is out in the foyer at the Welcome Center. Take a copy of that, pray over that, as we will vote that into effect, Lord willing, a week from today, following service and following the meal. Now, regarding the meal, uh, the table fellowship is so important. In fact, what we know about the early church is every time they got together, they ate. Because table fellowship creates a unique opportunity to let your hair down, get to know each other a little more, how to minister, pray for each other. So we want to do that before we enter into a time of looking at at different things in the life of the church. So if you would be so kind to contribute to that meal, there's a sign-up sheet out here. The church will provide the ham and the rolls, and then we're going to fill everything else in. So please sign up out there. Last day to sign up um, is today. And then that following Wednesday, week from this Wednesday, we'll have our monthly midweek meal at 5.30. Uh, We're going to have ham and potato soup. You can guess where the ham's going to come from. Uh, Ham and potato soup. And we're going to have that meal together 5.30 to 6.30. And then 6.30 to 7.30, we'll come up here for a time of prayer. Also, a sign-up sheet out there. Uh, There is a cost there uh, as well. So see that and plan to join us a week from this Wednesday. And then finally, uh, it's hard to believe, but Christmas Day is quickly approaching. And we want you to get prepared now to make this a priority in your uh, rhythm as chaos hits here soon. Uh, First of all, on uh, Christmas Eve, candlelight service, five o'clock. No child care during that time, so it's going to be a a fun time, uh, a worshipful time, and we'll light candles, and it will be a tremendous time five o'clock. Understand you normally maybe have some rhythms with families. We moved it to five o'clock, hopefully so you can all come together, celebrate Christ with us, and then able to go to your traditions that you have with your family. And then the next morning, 1030, no small groups that day, just service at 1030. We will have child care that day uh, at zero to six years old. So invite someone. It's a great time of year always to invite someone to come. Always a great time rather to invite someone but especially a great time to invite someone to worship during this Advent season leading in to Christmas. So stand with me if you would, and let's pray together one more time. Lord God, thank you again for this time to worship you corporately. Thank you for the gospel. 
Thank you that our identity is truly found in Christ and Christ alone. Lord, thank you for Lottie Moon. Thank you for your grace that was so evident in her life and how she allowed you to use her life to traject it for the gospel, for the fame and name of Jesus being spread. Lord, I pray that we would have that same missionary eyes and missionary heart, not just as we send dollars. I pray we would do that. But Lord, I pray that we live on mission right here in Northeast Ohio, where we know so many people are looking for love in all the wrong places, and they're looking at it for places that will leave them spiritually bankrupt. So Christ and Christ alone can satisfy. Thank you, Jesus, for dying for our sins. Thank you, Jesus, for giving us the joy of calling you our nearest and dearest friend. Lord, for those who are brokenhearted among us, Lord, would you be near to them? For those who are experiencing relational, financial, familial, or circumstantial pain, would you be near? Also, Lord, we look around and see many of our brothers and sisters are not here because of sickness, even right now. Would you put your hand of healing upon them? Would you grant them peace in their hearts, God, that you are going to see them through this challenging season. For those, Lord, who are among us that are not believers, Lord, would you cause them to be born again as your gospel is proclaimed? Lord, would you grant us the Spirit's help in a moment to see you in your word, to glory in you, to respond in magnification and praise at all that you are? Lord, thank you for those who have come prepared to give financially. Help us to be cheerful in that. Lord, we bless your name for the many who walk in financial generosity in the life of this body, for the good of this body. Lord, may that sense of cheerfulness truly stir our hearts to not just give of our treasure, but of our time, of our talents as well. So, Lord, be magnified. Be praised. And we bless your name today, and we pray it in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit. Amen. I've always thought that the first Advent Sunday is the hardest Advent Sunday, to switch gears and get our hearts prepared for the Advent season, for Christmas, to come out of a busy Thanksgiving week. And so as we use this song to prepare our hearts to hear the word preached to us during this Advent season, I know you know it well. Let's sing it together. Oh, come, all ye faithful, joyful and triumphant. Oh, come, ye, oh, come, ye to Bethlehem. Come and behold him, born the King of angels. Oh, come, let us adore Him. Oh, come, let us adore Him. Oh, come, let us adore Him, Christ the Lord. Sing choirs of angels. Sing in exaltation, O oh, sing, all ye bright hosts of heaven above. Glory to God, glory in the highest, O oh, come, let us adore him. Oh, come, let us adore him. Oh, come, let us adore him, Christ the Lord. Yea, Lord, we greet thee, born this happy morning. Jesus. 
Jesus, to Thee be all glory again. Word of the Father, now in flesh appealing. Oh, come, let us adore Him. Oh, come, let us adore Him. Oh, come, let us adore Him, Christ the Lord. Amen, church. You guys can have a seat. If you have your Bibles, Luke 1, if you'll join me there, Luke chapter 1, as we begin this new sermon series coming out of the book of Colossians for like a long time, and we've got a long way to go, but we pause during this time to look at the songs of Advent, the songs of Advent, and we're going to journey over these next four to five weeks through Luke chapter 1. And Luke chapter 2, and throughout church history, the church has have, have used these four songs very strategically in preaching through these songs and thinking through these songs and praying through these songs as a means to ready our hearts for the celebration of the first advent of the Lord Jesus. And we share in that goal this year. We share in that goal of utilizing these songs to bring us the hearers of these songs, into the reality of Advent, but also into the reality of our own lives. See, friends, Advent is for those who are scared about the future, like Mary. Advent is for those who have experienced severe disappointment and failure, like Elizabeth and Zechariah. Advent is for those who fear where God may be leading them, like the shepherds. And Advent is for those who have waited for a lifetime for God to fulfill His promises, much like Simeon and Anna. These songs show us that Advent, as Joseph and that candle still giving us trouble, That Advent truly is light coming into darkness. It reminds us of the joy that is the announcement of Jesus. So stand with me one more time. And let's honor God by reading this song together. This is referred to as Mary's Magnificat. Mary's Magnificat, beginning in verse 46... And the reason it is called the Magnificat is this first line, that my soul magnifies the Lord. That is one phrase in Latin, and it is the the word Magnificat. And so notice 46, and Mary said, my soul magnifies the Lord, or Magnificat, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior, for He has looked on the humble estate of His servant." For behold, from now on, all generations will call me blessed. For he who is mighty has done great things for me, and holy is his name. And his mercy is for those who fear him from generation to generation. He has shown, verse 51, strength with his arm. He has scattered the proud in the thoughts of their hearts. He has brought down the mighty from their thrones and exalted those of humble estate. He has filled the hungry with good things, 
The rich he sent them away. He has helped his servant Israel in remember of his mercy. As he spoke to our fathers, to Abraham and to his offspring forever. And Mary remained with her about three months and returned to her home. This is the word of the Lord. And Lord, I thank you for this truth. Holy Spirit, we've read the words on the screen. We've read the words on paper. God, now would you give us eyes to see spiritually all that you have for us today. We ask it for Christ's sake. Amen. You may be seated. Now, to give you some background leading up to verse 46, the angel Gabriel has appeared to Mary and has given her this miraculous message that she is going to bear in her womb the Son of God. And he would be God's appointed king, and he would rule in all the earth, and of his rule there would be no end. And Gabriel tells her, after Mary says, how is this going to be? And Gabriel says, well, the Holy Spirit, he's going to overshadow you, and you will receive a child, you will conceive a holy child, a child, one who is not tainted by sin in any way. And Mary, Gabriel says, if you need a sign for this, if you need confirmation of this, well, your relative, Elizabeth, who's literally like 100 miles away from here, 70 to 100 miles on the other side of Judah, if you need confirmation, she, is a, she was a barren woman, a woman in old age, and she too has had a miraculous conception. And she is going to have a birth that will be miraculous as well. Notice verse 39. In those days, Mary arose and went with haste into the hill country to a town in Judah, and she entered the house of Zechariah and greeted Elizabeth. And 41, when Elizabeth heard the greeting of Mary, the baby, that's John the Baptist in her womb, the baby leaped in her womb, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. Now, friends, the reason that Mary goes to Elizabeth is because, again, the angel Gabriel has told her, go there, you, or go and get confirmation there, and she takes this probably three-month walk from where she was Pretty impressive, by the way, through the Judean hillside, pretty rugged. In fact, most scholars would probably say somebody was with her. She's just a teenager, but maybe not. Either way, this is a, a very notable act for a young teenager to make the trek. And it says Elizabeth here, full of the Holy Spirit, prophesies literally, and confirms, listen Mary, God is fulfilling the promise that the angel Gabriel gave to you. And so Mary having this confirmation that she is bearing the Son of God, the King who will bring salvation to all of God's people, she responds and she writes a song. And this is how we get the Magnificat. She has recognized what is taking place, in one sense, that song that you know, Mary, did you know? Let me just tell you, in many ways, she knew. In many ways, not to dismantle your belief in that song, but if you think from that song that somehow Mary didn't have an understanding, then you don't understand that correctly. In many ways, she, she knew, she understood, and she responds so much so that she knows that she breaks out in praise. And by the way, as you, as you make your way through this, this expose, this song, it is masterfully and artistically blending together a theology of redemption. See, friends, great truths deserve great poetry. Great truths deserve great poetry. And great poetry deserves to be sung. Great truths deserve to be sung. In fact, if you looked at the four songs that the good Dr. Luke puts in chapter 1 and chapter 2, there's no reason for him to put those in there. They don't help the narrative, they don't hurt the narrative, but he saw fit under the Spirit's inspiration to put these four songs in the narrative. You could think of Dr. Luke as the original hymnologist of the church. It's really important for Luke to put these songs in the narrative, and, and the question becomes why. Well, my speculation is because when you recognize all that is going on here, what should produce in you and in me is singing, worship, magnifying God. 
And so Luke invites us into worship. Worship in light of the truths he's writing about. And this song forces you and forces me to think carefully about the nature and the character of God. Any, any song worth its salt that's deemed a worship song should not have the worshiper at the main portion of the song as though he is the one giving us a good example of how to worship. But any good worship song worth its salt will make one think and ponder the nature and the character and the beauty and the amazement of God. Now, there's no way that Mary, some say, could write a song like this. After all, friends, she's probably 13 years old. She's a teenager for crying out loud. How could she write a song like this? And some skeptics say there's no way she wrote this song. Somehow Luke wrote it and he put it in there and he deemed Mary's name on it. I think the answer is very simple. The answer is very simple of how could she write such a song like this? Mary knew her Bible. Mary knew her Bible. As a young girl, Mary had been saturated in the truths of Scripture. It's clear Mary had a synagogue background. It's clear Mary had someone in her life who was living out Deuteronomy 6, writing Scripture everywhere, saturating her in the truths of God. Mom, Dad, please listen to me. Don't ever underestimate the power of saturating your children in the Word of God. Don't ever underestimate riding it to, fro, everywhere, near, and wide. There's no way that Mary could have written such a song like this if she had not known her Bible. It is a good and necessary thing for our children to memorize the Bible. It is a good and necessary thing for our children to memorize doctrine and memorize theology and Bible words. Ember and I like to call that kindling. You're putting kindling around them so that when the Spirit of God does the work of regeneration in their hearts, there's something there to light the truths around them. Clearly, Mary had been taught the Scripture. And, and watch this now. When the Holy Spirit moved upon her to pen this song, she drew upon the wealth of Scripture that she had heard when she was just a little girl. Because as you read the song, well, listen to this. It's filled with Old Testament allusions. Genesis, Deuteronomy, First and Second Samuel, Job, Psalm, Isaiah, Ezekiel, Micah, Habakkuk, Zephaniah, and more. And, and the most obvious allusion here is to Hannah's song, 1 Samuel chapter 2, when she writes that song. Um, and Mary might have meditated as she made her way through that three-month journey when she got the news from Gabriel and began to head to the other side of Judah. She may have been meditating on the oral tradition of 1 Samuel chapter 2, because when she writes this song, if, that, if you go back and read 1 Samuel 2 and you lay it beside the Magnificat, you are looking at basically the same song in a lot of ways. And so... Sometimes we hear today that kids can't learn scripture, kids can't learn theology. We just point them to the Magnificat and we just simply say, yes, they can. If they can order off the menu at Starbucks, they can learn some the theological terms. Let's raise the bar a little bit on our adolescent culture, amen? Amen. Let's raise the bar a little bit. Mary was a saturated little teenage girl, and when she wrote this song, the Bible just comes oozing out of her. Notice 46, and Mary said, my soul magnifies the Lord. My spirit rejoices in God, my Savior. Notice where this singing is coming from. It's coming from her soul. That's the depth of her with emotion, with passion, with authenticity. She makes much of God. She magnifies God. She highly esteems God. And by the way, underline the word rejoices in your Bible. The word rejoice here has the idea of dancing, of shouting, of leaping. There's a visible manifestation of excitement in Mary's life. Unforced facial expression. You know what that's like, unforced facial expression. To see someone who's really happy about something, and they have a sense of awe, a sense of glee, a sense of shock, a sense of joy. You know, our family, one thing we really enjoy doing is riding around in the car. We see a lot of Ohio while our children sleep. 
But before they sleep, as we're riding around, we love to listen to go- all kinds of genres of God-glorifying music, all right? And there are certain songs that come on, and I look in the rearview mirror, and I see Eden and Theo, they make faces of excitement and joy, and they just can't wait to burst out in song. Now, in that moment, I don't say, okay, children, get your faces ready. Okay, children, get your faces of excitement ready because a song is coming on that you really like. No, I just play the song. We just play the song. And from that song, inhibited, uninhibited praise comes from them. And that's what's going on in Mary. She realizes all that Gabriel has said is true. She realizes that Elizabeth has confirmed it, given the scripture that she has hidden in her heart, and she cannot contain it to herself from her soul. She bursts out in praise, and she begins to write down, my soul magnifies the Lord. See, friends, it's only people who see and understand God and encounter him this way that will worship with this kind of intensity, and this kind of passion. Have you ever noticed how two people can sit in the same room and encounter God differently? Some are bursting at the seams. It doesn't mean they're crying. It doesn't mean they're flipping pews and jumping benches. But it does mean that there's a sense of excitement and glee in them as they think upon the words on the screen, the words in the Bible, what we're pointing to. And then there's other people in that same congregation who are just yawning. And they're thinking, what, is, what are we going to have for lunch? The Browns going to win today? I can't believe he did this, she did that. And they completely miss it. It's because some see, friends. Some don't see. Some people encounter God. Other people miss Him. Some people hear, yet they don't hear. Jesus said all throughout His teaching. As he's unpacking divine truth, some hear, but they don't hear. Some see, but they don't see. And there are people who come into solid gospel preaching churches, just like this one, just like a number in our area and around the world. They see lyrics, they see Bible passages, but they don't see. So therefore, they don't worship. Only those who see and in hear and encounter the person, the power, the plan, the presence of God. My hope this Advent season, friend, is that you would encounter God, that you would encounter Him afresh, that you would see Him afresh, that you would magnify His name from your soul afresh. Because during this season, let me tell you a couple of things that you are going to experience. Number one, stress. Can I get an amen? Stress. Parties to plan for, parties to go to, family to visit, family not to visit, presents to buy, presents not to buy. Should I buy for her? Should I buy for him? Are they going to buy for me? So therefore, should I not buy for them? And just on and on and on and on. The stress, I'm telling you, if you have not experienced the stress of the season, just be patient. It's coming. The other thing you're going to experience is sentimentality, not just stress, but sentimentality, oh, sentimentality, oh, sentimentality. Some of you have been listening to Christmas music since October. Some of you have been listening to it since the summertime. Some of you really like lights, and you really like trees, and you really like eggnog, and you really like traditions and, and, and window displays. Your halls, they've been decked. And let me say this to you, there's nothing wrong with that. But it is possible to go through this season and have a lot of stress and a lot of sentimentality, but no encounter with God. No encounter fresh with the living God. My hope is you wouldn't miss it, that you wouldn't wither under the stress and that you wouldn't wisp under the cocoa bombs and the trees and the tinsel and the Will Ferrell and the Charles Dickens and the Jimmy Stewart and the cheesy Hallmark movies (laughs) that all end the same way. And all that replaces a fresh encounter with God. Friends, Mary encountered God. She saw him afresh. And so what does Mary sing and sing about? Well, there's three points I want you to see in the text. Three points. Um, Number one, Mary rejoices in God's purpose, 48 to 50. Number two, Mary rejoices in God's plan, 
And then finally, Mary rejoices in God's promises. So God's purpose, God's plan, God's promises. One point this week to next week. Number one, Mary rejoices in God's purpose. Notice, he has looked, 48, on the humble estate of his servant. For behold, from now on, all generations will call me blessed. For he who is mighty has done great things for me, and holy is his name. See, Mary understands that God is unfolding His purpose here, His great drama of redemption, that He is bringing His Savior in the world as He promised, that there will be radical divine mercy given. I mean, you understand the last book of the Old Testament to the first book of the New Testament, um, there is silence for hundreds of years. And if you read the last book of the Old Testament and you see the idolatry that God's people were caught up in and just the nastiness and the abandonment of Yahweh that they were experiencing, you will fully see the sheer mercy that God has in sending a rescuer, sending a deliverer. And friends, this is what Christmas is all about. It is the manifestation of God's grace toward a broken, sinful world. Listen, Christmas is God saying, I I don't want to kick the world to pieces. I don't want to kick the world to pieces. I want to rescue it. I want to heal it. And Christmas is also saying to you, I don't want to kick your life to pieces. I love you. I want to rescue you. I want to forgive you. I want to restore you. I want to put the broken pieces of your life back together. And Mary understands, I'm a recipient of this. Mary understands, I am one who is not worthy of this. Listen, as pure as Mary is, as favored here as it says Mary is, she is a godly, scripture-saturated, very pious teenager, but she still knows that she needs a Savior. She's not the queen of heaven. She's not a co-redeemer. She's not to be worshipped. She is one who needs to be saved. And she is bearing the one who will save her from her own sins. So she rejoices in God's purpose in all of this, that he is working in this. But also Mary realizes, not just God has seized me for a purpose, but he's also seized me because he's got something he wants me to be a part of in the purpose. Notice 48, the humble estate. Notice 49, for he who is mighty has done great things for me. God says to Mary, not only will you receive my salvation, but I want to use you in my great plan of redemption for the world. Notice 50, and his mercy, his mercy, his mercy is for those who fear him from generation to generation. Friend, you and I need to be saved by God. You and I need the mercy of God. You and I need not just our sins forgiven, we need our lives put back together. He he doesn't want to kick your life to pieces. He wants to save you. He wants to rescue you. He wants to renew you. See, Mary is a great example of a true believer. Saved by mercy, seized for a purpose. Saved by mercy, seized for a purpose. See, there's great joy knowing that you're saved. Amen? There's great joy knowing that God has saved you via the gospel. Man, there's joy in knowing that your sins are forgiven. As we confessed our sins earlier, we we have that as a rhythm because we recognize sin was our greatest problem, and it's been dealt with. It's been dealt with in the person and the work of Jesus Christ, and that heaven is our home. I mean, friend, your life right now, it, it could be falling apart, but to know that you're loved, that you're chosen, that you're forgiven, that you're a recipient of divine mercy. There's joy in that. Furthermore, there's joy in knowing, like Mary, that God actually wants to use your life, to leverage your life, to fulfill His purpose in the world. We, we too, can be recipients of this, to receive salvation and then extend salvation. You weren't just supposed to receive salvation, friend. You weren't supposed to keep it to yourself. You are to receive it and then to extend it to other people. Now, look back up at 48, because there's something here I really want you to see. He says, for behold, from now on, underline that in your Bible, from now on, 
all generations will call me blessed. Now think about this. Mary had aspirations for her life. God says, Mary, I'm, I'm going to overrule your aspirations. Mary, I'm going to overrule the plan that you have for your life. Mary, you think this is going to happen with your life? Again, she's 13 years old, very young girl. I mean, I want you to think about when you were 13. Did you have aspirations for your life? Did you? Did you have aspirations for your life when you were 13 years old? I was convinced as a little guy that I was going to be a starting pitcher for the Texas Rangers. And I had a shrine of a poster of Nolan Ryan in my room. And I just knew I was going to follow in his footsteps. That, that was the aspiration that I had for my life. And you know when I was 19, that dream died. I remember, I remember a season in my life when I was 19 years old. Ephesians 4, 11 to 13, God, by His sovereign grace, I felt the call to vocational ministry. And I knew from that point, from now on, from now on, my life is different now. It's not the same. My life is forever altered. About that same time, I remember picking up a couple of books. One book, Knowing God by J.I. Packer. Another book, Religious Affections by Jonathan Edwards. And those two books they made me think about God in a way I didn't even know I should be thinking about God. They, they, they completely turned my understanding of who God is on its head and made me see God in all of his bigness. And from now on, from that season of life, I knew I'll never think about God the same. I'll never, re I'll never think about him in some low status. I'll never think that God doesn't want my affections to be hot for him. It changed me. I remember another season in my life when I read the book of Acts every day for 31 days, the whole book. And I remember God using that time to completely shape my heart to give everything I had to the health of the local church. From now on, my life was altered. I remember another season when I was 25 years old and I took the hand of a, of a woman named Ember Zelke and she became my wife. That was a from now on moment. I remember when our children were born, seeing Eden, seeing Theo, that was a from now on moment. But the biggest from now on moment is when I was 10 years old and I realized for the first time in my church-saturated life that I needed a Savior, that I was guilty before God. And upon faith alone in Christ alone, I went into the baptistry and, and I said, I want everyone to know that I am identifying with Jesus. My allegiance is to him as my Lord, Savior, Master, King. And from now on, my life was changed. As a 10-year-old, from now on, my life was changed. Mary's life was changed here. From now on, all the things that she thought she was going to accomplish, God killed those. So let me ask you this question. Have you had some from now on moments like that in your life? The greatest from now on moment you could ever have is embracing the mercy of God in Christ. Recognizing that He's coming after you for a purpose, to save you, to seize you, to outline for you the plan that He has. Now there are some from now on moments that are painful, amen? Some of us have been changed by things in our past and will never be the same. From now on, that moment, from now on. My life will never be the same. And unfortunately, you will face a lot more from now on moments where you're never going to be the same because you're going to be altered in a really hurtful, painful, people are going to do things to you that you didn't think another human being could do to you. That, that type of stuff. From, that's going to affect you. And unfortunately, that's the world that we live in. And that's what makes us long for Advent, right? That's what makes us long for not just the first coming of Christ, but the celebration that Christ is coming again. And ultimately, the purpose that he had for Mary to, to bring him into the world, it will find its culmination or consummation when he comes again and he sets the world right. Oh, I pray that we would encounter fresh the mercy of God this year since that he is seizing us for a purpose, recognizing that we don't exist for us. You know, we've, we've been saying throughout the Colossians series, Jesus made you not to make much of you. Jesus made you so that you can make much of him. And that's a very different way to live. And Mary is, is a poster child that life is not about her. Life is about from now on recognizing the seizing of God and the saving of God on her life. So if you don't know Jesus today, like in a saving way, would you hear him saying to you, come to me, come to me, I offer eternal rest, come to me? 
But if you know Jesus in a saving way, would you hear him saying this to you? I'm seizing you for a purpose that is bigger than any little dream or thing that you could come up with of how you think your life is supposed to go. See, Mary is a channel of the mercy of God, bringing the Son of God into the world. And let's be clear, this is a unique event. All right, this is, this is a one-time event. This is a salvific event that will not be replicated. But this God who seized her and ultimately saved her is ultimately the one who will save you and seize you for a purpose. And I would tell you this, your purpose and my purpose is to make everything about the Lord Jesus Christ in our life and magnify his name as we point people to him. God has given us this gospel for it to be a channel through us. Just as the purpose of God for Mary was for her to, to be a channel for the mercy of God to come through her, you and I are recipients and then channels of the mercy of God in this age. So God has saved you. He has seized you for a purpose. I hope and I pray that we would taste and we would see that afresh again. The saving work of God, the seizing work of God, in the life of Mary on into today as we long for the coming of Jesus Christ when he will make all things right. And the government, the Bible says, will be upon his shoulders. Pray with me. Our Lord and King, I thank you for your plan of redemption. Lord, that you would choose to use the humble estate of Mary Lord, we magnify you. We recognize your purpose in Mary was to save her and to seize her. Oh, Lord, I pray for someone in this room or someone who is watching online who has not thought about that, that their saving that you granted them was not just for them to be able to made much of by you, but Lord, their life is not their own. My life is not my own. It is to be used to channel the mercy of God into the world. A world, Lord, that so desperately needs you. A world that is hostile towards you. And but for your grace and your mercy at work in the world, Lord, we all would be eternally doomed. I pray for our parents, Lord, especially those who have young children even teenagers, even young adults, that these parents would see Mary as a saturated teenager in your word. Lord, help us not waste this opportunity as moms, as dads, as guardians, as grandparents, aunts, uncles, to declare your mighty acts to the next generation. Lord, would you raise up teenagers and children among us who love you, a desire to please you in all they do. Lord, may our teenagers look at Mary and just marvel at her devotion to you. Lord, how you saved her and you seized her. And Lord, for those among us who have never found the eternal rest that is offered to us in the gospel, Holy Spirit, would you grant eyes to see? I thank you that there are from now on moments in our lives that you've altered us forever, Lord. We are no longer our own. Finally, for all of us, Lord, who've, who've called upon your name, may we truly be a conduit of your mercy that is offered in the gospel as we engage people this Advent season and as we rest in the glorious good news of the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Father, we pray this by the Spirit. As we stand to our feet, let's respond in song. Church, as we stand, uh, we're going to sing my favorite Christmas song. I think it's one of the hardest songs to sing corporately, but that doesn't matter. Let's sing loud. There are a few verses of this song that are usually unfamiliar to folks, and we're going to sing them this morning. And I would like to read for you the words of verse 3. The song goes like this. Come to earth to taste our sadness, he whose glories knew no end. By his life he brings us gladness, our redeemer, shepherd, friend, leaving riches without number born within a cattle stall, this the everlasting wonder. Christ was born the Lord of all. This is the everlasting wonder, that he came to earth to taste our sadness, that he left his glories, so why? So that we could be glad.
So let's sing this song together as we long for the expected Jesus. Expected Jesus, born to set thy people free from our sins and fears. Release us, let us find our rest in thee. Israel, strength and consolation, hope. Of all the earth thou art, dear desire of every nation, joy of every longing heart. Joy to those who long to see the day spring from on high appear. Come, thou promise rod of Jesse, of thy birth we long to hear. O'er the hills the angels singing news, glad tidings of a birth. Go to him your praises bringing, Christ the Lord has come to earth. Come to earth to taste our sadness. He whose glory is new, no end. By his life he brings us gladness. Our Redeemer, Shepherd, Friend. Leaving riches without number, born within a cattle stall. This the everlasting wonder, Christ was born the Lord of all. Born thy people to deliver, born a child and yet a king, born to reign in us forever, now thy gracious kingdom bring. By thine own eternal spirit rule in all our hearts alone. By thine all sufficient merit raise us to thy glorious throne. Well, friends, as we prepare to go, as we launch out into what we know will be the stress of the season and the sentimentality of the season, may we be reminded, in the case of Mary, the saving purposes of God and the seizing purposes of God. As you go out, as you eat, as you engage those people, think about this. God has saved me to be an extension of his mercy to the world. May that shape your thought. May that shape my thought that we might truly grasp everything that the Lord Jesus has for us 
this Advent season. Thank you again to Chuck, to Hanny for leading us today. Let me leave you with a final benediction. Now may the God of peace, Hebrews 13, may the God of peace who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, by the blood of the eternal covenant, equip you with everything good that you might do his will, working in us that which is pleasing to him through our Lord Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever and everyone said. Have a great week. You are dismissed.